Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event, a conversation about Australia's low carbon opportunity with Professor Ross Garno. My name is Petra Stock, and I'm a campaigner at the Australian Conservation Foundation, and I'll be your host for this evening. And I just wanna let you know that this event is being recorded. So if you do wanna watch it back later, uh, you'll be able to. Um, and just before commencing our discussion tonight, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are gathered. I'm here in Melbourne or Nam, and I'm coming to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'll also acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and this is, remains Aboriginal land. And please feel free as I've seen some of you are doing um, to acknowledge the lands from which you're joining us in the chat box. Um, I'd also like to extend my gratitude to some of the groups that have helped organize tonight's event. They are the ACF Community Group, McNamara, Port Phillip Climate Action Network and Glen Ira Climate Action Network. I also want to acknowledge the incredible donors who power the work that ACF does to build people power, change the story and fix the system. Without your support, our work would simply not be possible. And our speaker tonight, he needs little introduction. Professor Ross Garno AC is one of Australia's most respected climate and energy policy experts having held senior roles in government and business. Professor Garno authored the 2008 report, which feels like such a long time ago now, the Garno Climate Change Review, which provided advice to the then Rudd government about the likely impacts of climate change on Australia's economy and society, and the need for strong emissions reduction policies. He's a professor Professorial Research Fellow in Economics at the University of Melbourne and Chairman and Co-Founder of Zen and Sunshot Energy. And tonight we're thrilled to be able to offer all of you here a small discount on Professor Garno's most recent book, Superpower, thanks to the publisher's Black Ink Books. And information about how to access this offer will be provided in the chat box. Now I'm sure you'll all join me in extending a very warm uh, virtual welcome to Professor Ross Garno. Uh, good evening, Ross. Good evening, Petra. Very good to be with you. Now, in your 2019 book, Superpower, Australia's Low Carbon Opportunity, you set out a roadmap for how Australia can prosper in the global transition that's underway from fossil fuels to clean energy. And I understand you have a soon to be released book, Reset, Restoring Australia After the Pandemic Recession. In, and in that book, you make the case for how the COVID-19 crisis offers Australia the opportunity to really reset our economy and build a successful future. And why some of those old approaches that Australia has taken in the past won't work. Maybe you could start by setting the scene for us all here tonight about what this opportunity looks like for Australia and the sorts of opportunities you see on the horizon for our country, particularly as we recover from this coronavirus pandemic. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Petra, and my respects to the Wurundjeri people on whose land I now am. After eight months continuously on the land of the Inangai people in the central west of Queensland, where my wife Jane and I uh, uh, set out the Melbourne COVID in, in uh, warmth and uh, natural social distancing. Uh, Yes, as you uh, mentioned, I've, uh, I've got a, a book coming out um, at the end of February, uh, Black Ink, the publisher, uh, Reset. Uh, that follows a series of half a dozen public lectures I gave through the University of Melbourne from the central west of Queensland, from uh, Park Alden uh, in May and June. Uh, and uh, I've deliberately uh, uh, left 
putting it finally to bed until now, uh, until this last week, actually, because uh, a couple of big developments in uh, uh, policy in Australia and politics in the rest of the world were going to be very important to uh, how Australia's opportunity plays out in the period ahead. Most importantly, of course, uh, the US election, where uh, the difference uh, on things that are very important to Australia and to uh, the, uh, the world um, on climate, um, could, the differences could not have been more stark between uh, those that would have resulted from uh, a return of President Trump and uh, those that uh, are likely to be associated with uh, a government led by uh, President Biden. Um, the Biden election has been followed very promptly with his announcement of a number of senior uh, cabinet positions um, uh, that are very strongly committed to action on climate change. Uh, uh, most importantly, the appointment of um, John Kerry, former Secretary of State, uh, uh, former presidential candidate himself, a very senior uh, political figure in the US, very effective one. Uh, he was Secretary of State for Obama when the Paris Agreement was put together and uh, at his age and stage uh, he would not have uh, been asked to play that role and would not have accepted it un uh, unless he was going to make it a big deal. Uh, and uh, uh, Biden has made it clear that he expects the United States to play um, a leadership role uh, on climate. Uh, he took to the uh, presidential election uh, a, a commitment to uh, uh, zero net emissions by 2050 uh, and also uh, a means of getting there, a commitment to spend, uh, to make expenditure related to the energy and climate transition uh, the, the main focus of the stimulus that's going to be necessary to get the United States out of uh, the pandemic recession. Uh, 1.7 trillion US dollars. Uh, uh, there, there was nothing wrong with uh, uh, the five uh, technologies in Angus Taylor's roadmap uh, uh, for, but uh, the total fiscal commitment, uh, which in the absence of carbon price is what the fiscal commitment that has to be the main motor behind uh, change. Uh, the, uh, the, the fiscal commitment uh, an announced around the time of the roadmap was, was no more than a couple of percent uh, uh, of uh, the per capita uh, weighted uh, commitment that uh, the Biden administration has made. Uh, so I, um, and uh, the US committing itself to zero net emissions by 2050 uh, joins all of the world's uh, developed countries uh, and also China in commitments around mid-century. Uh, Europe, the UK, Japan, Korea committed to zero net emissions by 2050. China, uh, 2060. Um, uh, and uh, I, I would be hope, I would hope that all of them will find that uh, uh, that once they're making rapid progress, uh, uh, the economic advantages of moving faster uh, cause them to move faster. Uh, but just making those commitments and the US joining them, China being part of it is uh, a huge change in the international situation. But already we've seen substantial change in the rhetoric of the Australian government. Uh, 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 when we hear from uh, the Prime Minister that uh, one of the reasons we don't want to commit to uh, mid-century uh, zero emissions, we might get there faster. Uh, and uh, uh, it actually is not tenable for an Australian government uh, uh, to uh, stand outside uh, uh, the, the very strong commitments that are being made by all of the other developed countries and China, which uh, when you add them together are a very large part of our trading universe. And the, the US and Europe are going, have made it clear they're going to be pretty tough-minded uh, 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 in relation to trade with countries that uh, that are still making um, goods in the old-fashioned ways with 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 lots of carbon, uh, and that's uh, that's going to be 
uh, a, a rather practical reason to get on board. But Australia's reasons for getting on board are bigger than those of any other country. And that's the story of uh, superpower. Um, uh, when I did my uh, report, and Petra, in your introduction, you said it was it seems a long time ago. Well, it was a long time ago. Uh, uh, I was asked to do that on the Anzac Day weekend of uh, 20, 2007. Uh, by all the states, and you said it was a report for the state government. It was actually of the federal government. It was actually initially commissioned by the six states and two territories. Uh, and Dan Obley, as Premier of Queensland, um, um, made the approach on behalf of the premiers and chief ministers. And uh, the Commonwealth was invited to join. And uh, in December, uh, the Commonwealth became part of a joint federal-state uh, exercise when Kevin Rudd became prime minister. Um, uh, and looking back, that was rather remarkable period of uh, policy making to have six states, two territories in the Commonwealth, all supporting a, uh, a forward looking major piece of work on climate change policy. But not only that, uh, the, what I was doing had the strong support of the opposition in the federal parliament uh, at the time led by a man called Malcolm Turnbull. He's, uh, 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 a good friend of mine, Malcolm, who sort of receded into uh, uh, into the shadows since then, but uh, well well known figure at that time. And uh, 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 Malcolm uh, made sure that key members of his uh, front bench regularly met with me, so that uh, at that time Australia was on board. Uh, it all fell apart in December. Uh, 2009, when uh, on the climate change issue, uh, Tony Abbott became leader of the Liberal Party, pushed uh, Malcolm Turnbull aside by a single vote just before the, the carbon pricing legislation, which had passed the House of Representatives, was due to uh, go to the Senate. So that, that was a big bit of history. And since then, uh, we, we've uh, had uh, a bumpy road on climate and energy policy, and that's been very costly to us. Uh, um, uh, when I did that original work, a very elaborate modelling of uh, the effects, the costs and effects on the Australian economy, both of climate change, um, a big negative increasing over time, uh, and also the, the costs of, of doing something about it, of Australia reducing em emissions at a rate that had us playing our proportionate part, our full part in a global effort to control uh, climate change. Um, when I did that work, the the, uh, uh, the early decades were going to see substantial costs. Uh, my modelling showed substantial costs, but the benefits of acting on climate change, the economic benefits, uh, comfortably outweighed the, the costs of us playing our part in the global effort. The story of superpower is how uh, is a story of how if uh, I did that detailed work again, and it took me... Uh, uh, 14 or 15 months of pretty solid work, so it won't be done again by me. But uh, uh, the, if I did that again, um, uh, the big change is that uh, whereas then there was a, a cost of action, but it was worth doing because the cost of inaction was greater, uh, now you can see that there are actually uh, economic benefits from early action. Uh, uh, the electricity transition, which was then one of the big costs, um, would, would now be a, a net economic benefit. Doing it earlier uh, will give us lower ele electricity costs. But the, the story of superpowers, how the benefits for Australia extend beyond that. Uh, uh, the big benefit is not the reduction in costs of what we do now, cheaper electricity, after a few years, cheaper cars uh, with, with zero emissions, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, but but uh, as the world goes to zero emissions, as all developed countries plus China have committed to doing by mid-century, uh, uh, we will have huge uh, economic advantages in, in a number of important areas. Uh, we've got the best combination of wind and solar resources in the world. So in a world in which everyone is zero emissions, as we've committed to be, not very far in the future, uh, only halfway through the professional lives of you young people, uh, then uh, uh, in that world, Australia, unless it mucks things up, uh, will have the lowest cost energy. 
and that will give it advantages uh, in a whole lot of industries. And the, the, uh, the obvious one is processing our own minerals. Australia is by far the world's biggest exporter of um, iron oxide, iron ore, which other countries turn into iron uh, for steel making. Uh, well, in the zero emissions world economy, we're the low cost place to do that. Now we've, we've got the world's best metallurgical coal, uh, but uh, that doesn't give our own industry a big advantage because it's just as cheap to put that on a boat and take it to uh, Kobe or Shanghai as it is to, in fact, it's cheaper than to put it on a boat around to Wyala. Uh, so uh, uh, that, that, gave, that gives us no uh, advantage. Similarly, uh, Australian gas is as cheap to use in industrial centers in uh, uh, in Japan and Korea and China as it is uh, in Australia, but it'll be different for uh, renewable energy. There will be a big trade in renewable energy itself, uh, high voltage transmission lines going into Asia, that'll be a big story. And uh, conversion of uh, renewable energy into hydrogen, into ammonia, and then, then uh, sail overseas and uh, reconversion to hydrogen. Uh, but they're both very costly. The transport is very costly. So. Energy is going to be renewable energy is going to be much cheaper in Australia than in the countries that use electricity. Hydrogen will will be uh, uh, more than twice the cost in uh, Japan or Korea uh, as it is in Australia or Germany for for that matter. Uh, uh, so that will give us a sustainable advantage. The other big advantage that I emphasise in superpower is that we've got an awful lot of land per person. Big continent, not many people. Lots of woodlands lot more woodland per person than um, uh, than the developed countries. And developed countries have a lot more than the developing countries. And so that gives us an advantage in sequestering carbon in our soils and in our trees, our plants, uh, but also in growing biomass uh, in a sustainable way for uh, chemical industries. In today's world, we make plastics and other petrochemicals out of uh, coal or oil and or gas, and that's very emissions intensive. In the zero emissions world, uh, wherever we can, we'll be making those products that are currently made from coal and oil and gas through petrochemical processes uh, from, um, uh, for, by other means. For example, we'll be making nitrogenous fertilizers uh, from renewable energy, renewable hydrogen, and, and not emissions intensive uh, uh, gas-based uh, hydrogen. But, but there'll be a whole lot of those chemical products that where you can't find easy substitutes for hydrocarbons and we'll be using uh, renewable biomass uh, and uh, Australia has unusual advantages in that area as well. It's a characteristic of the new opportunities, both the processing of minerals and use of and energy intensive industries generally uh, and uh, sequestration of carbon in soils and, uh, and plants. Uh, and growing uh, uh, biomass in a sustainable way. It's characteristic of these that they're concentrated in rural and provincial Australia. So uh, they, these, these are a big story for provincial and rural development in Australia, not just for national development. Well, in the reset book, which you'll be able to get in, uh, uh, in uh, the end of Feb February, I had to write a book about the pandemic recession. I wrote one about the East Asian financial crisis uh, 22 years ago and one about the, the uh, global financial crisis 10 years ago. So uh, no way I can get away without writing a book about the pandemic recession as an economic phenomenon. And, I, and, and it's half of it is an economic story, but uh, analysis of the economics leads me to a straightforward conclusion that, uh, uh, that, that there is an opportunity uh, to uh, provide most of the increased investment, economic activity, employment we need to uh, uh, get to full employment and uh, rising incomes. We can get, well, there's an opportunity to get most of that from, uh, it, from the uh, energy transition and utilization of our opportunity as the superpower of the zero emissions economy. And I conclude in the book, Reset, Restoring Australia After the Pandemic Recession, that not only is it a possible way, it's probably the only way. Thanks. Thanks so much for that um, 
really uplifting introduction, Ross. Sometimes it's easy to forget in Australia how lucky we are with all these resources that we have. Um, you mentioned you uh, spent uh, much of this year in central Queensland and I wondered if you might be able to start by telling us a bit about the work that you're doing up there and, and, and what opportunities you see um, up there in Queensland. Yeah, uh, well, I, I'm doing that with the companies that I chair, uh, Sunshine Energy, which is involved in development of renewable energy and wholesale uh, trade in renewable energy and, and Zen Energy, which, has, which is a retailer. Uh, that the two operate as uh, one, one group. Uh, and uh, in these capacities, um, I was approached a few years ago by the mayors of the west of Queensland. Um, and uh, they said to me, uh, well, we know un underneath our feet, we've got the world's richest uh, underdeveloped uh, coal resource. And we've read that you say we've got above our heads Eastern Australia's best uh, renewable energy resource. Um, and uh, we, we know that the jobs that come from digging up what's underneath our feet um, have some limitations. They're not likely to be there forever. Uh, we'd much rather have sustainable jobs than unsustainable ones, but uh, no one's offered us any new jobs for the last one or two generations. Every kid and grandkid that any of us have had have ended up in Brisbane or further south. And uh, uh, so can you help us think about uh, how we can use our resources for sustainable jobs? So I've been talking about a few trips to the region and uh, uh, having a look at, uh, at the opportunities so we ended up and uh, came up with a few possibilities and um, uh, and then talk to companies that might be interested in them. And that, that was all moving along at a measured pace. But when the news came through from my colleagues at the University of Melbourne in the medical school that this COVID was gonna be a pretty nasty thing and uh, was gonna lock us up for an un unknown but considerable length of time, uh, Jane and I had a bit of a conversation at rather short notice said, uh, oh, we'll, we'll go to the central west of Queensland. and. Uh, our friends up there uh, arranged a nice place for us to stay. And uh, uh, and so uh, it's been a chance uh, alongside the, the reset lectures and, and chair, chairing board, board meetings for my companies, but uh, alongside that, uh, talking to people about accelerating use of the opportunity. And um, we decided to focus on Bark Alden first because uh, that's the one uh, uh, part of this Western Queensland region um, the, the, the seven shires that uh, are, are part of the, uh, the group that came to me uh, go all the way to, down to the uh, uh, New South Wales border and across to the, the Northern Territory and South Australian borders. But uh, uh, Bark Alden's the one with a, a fairly substantial uh, a grid link to the Queensland grid. So there were some places to start and had some other advantages. And so uh, we're working with uh, uh, the group, the corporation involving all of the councils with building industrial area for uh, renewable energy based industries, zero emissions uh, industries. And uh, we've, we've got two sets of projects. One that are pretty well ready to go now uh, includes um, protected agriculture. It's a pretty good place to, uh, uh, to, to grow uh, 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 fruit and vegetables in a greenhouse. A huge advantage to have so much sunshine uh, and it's even uh, winter and summer the sunshine because it's right on the Tropic of Capricorn um, and uh, uh, that, that, that even insulation and rich insulation is a big advantage if you can control temperatures. In southern Australia uh, horticultural greenhouses, uh, protected greenhouses uh, require a lot of energy to to keep the atmosphere warm on a winter's night. Well, in uh, central Western Queensland, you need a lot of energy to, to keep the greenhouse cool on a summer afternoon. Uh, um, but you, either way, you need a lot of cheap energy and, uh, and you can get that uh, excellent uh, solar uh, energy uh, and uh, in the right spots, reasonable uh, wind resources. Uh, you also need carbon dioxide, which uh, uh, 
is, is usually provided from a gas or coal based generator for greenhouses in southern Australia. Well, uh, we, we, we're working with um, uh, Desert Channels Queensland, uh, which has got a program of eradication of a, an invasive species, prickly acacia, to be part of that eradication and to use the uh, uh, the the, uh, uh, the the trees that are scrubbed out uh, um, a, through pyrolysis to uh, generate uh, bio oil and biochar, and uh, then you put the the bio uh, oil into a steam turbine. Uh, and we're also we're also working on uh, a plan to make hydrogen from uh, renewable energy, turn that into ammonia and urea. And because you're making hydrogen, you've got a lot of waste oxygen. So you can fire the steam turbine with the bio oil with oxygen, and you get a very pure carbon dioxide stream, perfect for the greenhouse, but also perfect to turn the ammonia into urea. Uh, but there's uh, a, a, another set of smaller industries. Once we started doing them, people started hearing about it. They came to us with other ideas. Uh, uh, they include uh, processing of vanadium and making flow batteries uh, out of the vanadium. Um, uh, um, the, both the mining company and a uh, battery uh, producer are interested in that. And uh, um, with the... Uh, uh, there, there are a couple of other pyrolysis um, uh, plants uh, once they heard what we we're doing are setting up to. All right, Russ, I'm going to jump in and just ask you what pyrolysis is. <laughs> I, don't I don't know. Well, you've probably heard of charcoal. Uh, uh, you make charcoal and charcoal, in a lot of rural Australia, we all the electricity when it was first made was made from renewable energy and uh, uh, you, you make charcoal and from charcoal if you had trees around probably chopped down too many trees to make charcoal for uh, uh, for electricity but uh, uh, yeah charcoal is is what you get when you uh, heat uh, timber or biomass in the absence of oxygen and uh, all the volatiles the gas and or hydrocarbons disappear and you're left with a very pure carbon, which is uh, very useful for industrial processes. They made steel from that before they used coal. Uh, 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 well, pyrolysis is a version of that, but it, you get more complete um, exclusion of uh, air and you keep all, as the volatiles, the gas and uh, oil are given off uh, you, you capture all that, so you've got to buy oil or uh, biogas, and you're left with a very pure char, a very pure carbon, which you can use for industrial purposes. You can um, use it, it enriches soils. Uh, it is permanent, more or less. Well, the international science um, talks of it as more or less per permanent carbon sequestration, because if you get it, once you get it in the soil in this form, it stays there. Uh, for hundreds of years anyway, uh, but the, the bio oil you can use for industrial processes to substitute for um, uh, oil in, uh, in plastics, or you can burn it as uh, uh, bioenergy, for bioenergy, that's what we'll do. Um, with a slightly different process, you can, um, uh, it comes off as a gas, not as an oil, and you can do, use it to do all the things a gas can do. So, so it's basically uh, heating to quite high temperatures using renewable energy and then the um, uh, endothermic uh, reactions of the process itself uh, uh, that that uh, drives off obviously the water in plants there's a lot of water in plants and uh, uh, and then uh, then the oil or uh, gas the hydrocarbons you're left with very pure carbon Charles becoming pretty exciting actually got a pretty exciting history if you uh, looked at the uh, in indigenous uh, farming patterns of the Amazon uh, but uh, uh, it can enrich soils. Uh, you can feed it to uh, uh, ruminant animals, sheep and cows, and uh, it leads to more complete digestion. Uh, therefore, the methane doesn't come, well, not all of it comes out as methane uh, if you've got that as part of the mix. So more of it goes into milk, uh, wool, or, uh, or, or meat because of more complete digestion. Then, but it's not digested itself, it comes out the other end of the sheep or cow and is then permanently sequestered as carbon. So it's pretty good stuff. It sounds like there's a lot uh, potentially underway in Queensland covering all different types of climate solutions. 
Um, just going to zoom out now because you mentioned in your introductory comments all of those countries now committed to net zero. Um, I think I heard you say the US, China, Japan, Korea. Um, so there's real change in that international space. And obviously uh, Australia is a big exporter to those countries as well. I think something like over 70% of our thermal coal exports are going to those countries combined and around 90% of our liquefied natural gas exports. Do you think these commitments uh, being made by these countries um, might pose some challenges for Australia um, as, you know, for our fossil fuel exports? And how can we, um, I guess, manage the shift from exporting fossil fuels to maybe exporting some different things to some of these countries? Oh, it's certainly a challenge. It's already a challenge. Um... The price of coal is much lower than it was a couple of years ago, and that's partly because, well, partly because the Chinese uh, have their own issues with us, but it's also partly because uh, uh, the growth in demand for uh, uh, coal is not there anymore. Uh, in Northeast Asia, uh, uh, in, in Korea, Japan, China, you've got very rapid growth of alternative uh, uh, sources of energy. Uh, and even in India, which uh, was the great white hope of, uh, uh, of, of the coal industry, uh, uh, you got very rapid growth in, in uh, renewable energy, uh, especially solar, but also um, wind, biomass, uh, hydro, uh, um, simply because it's become much cheaper. Uh, Adani is putting in a lot more uh, solar than, than uh, coal generation in uh, uh, in, in India and uh, business people like that who have been prepared to invest in coal don't do it because they love coal and if uh, solar and other forms of energy become cheaper they'll use that and that's the way the signs that India is doing it but uh, China's been doing it for a while. Uh, uh, Japan and Korea very strongly committed to the zero emissions transition but don't have such good renewable resources themselves and uh, uh, but uh, uh, they'll be, so, so it's not quite so easy for them. Uh, it's easier for China and uh, India to build uh, renewable alternatives. Uh, Korea and Japan uh, 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 have to focus on, um, on other things. But, but one way and another, coal demand has been falling in the last few years. With, very interesting this year with COVID, um, a global recession, uh, total demand for electricity has fallen in the world and in all the countries we're talking about and in Australia, uh, but uh, renewable uh, uh, output has actually increased and uh, not as rapidly as usual, uh, uh, but uh, it's actually increased so that the fall in, in coal use uh, has exceeded the fall in electricity use uh, because, uh, because there's been some growth in renewable energy use. Now, uh, that's a big challenge for Australia. Uh, I, th there's a lot of Australian uh, politicians who uh, like to kid the electorate and say, uh, we'll, we'll give you a future uh, uh, in, of jobs in the coal industry. Well, they won't deliver that, just like Trump promised uh, the coal miners of West Virginia a, a rosy future for coal mining and, and coal jobs have just fallen and fallen and fallen every year of the Trump presidency. He, he he took those workers for a ride. Uh, and any Australian politician who uh, is promising expanding jobs in coal is taking Australian workers for a ride because the international demand's not there. And, the, and what this recent recommitment to, uh, well, it's a stronger commitment than it's ever been to zero emissions in the developed countries plus China. Uh, what that means is that uh, it really uh, makes it very unlikely that um, that trend to lower uh, coal use uh, won't uh, uh, accelerate. Uh, in the, the case of gas, is slightly different, uh, not quite as, um, it's not as uh, emissions intensive, it will hang on for longer, but the trend is in the same direction. So uh, we need strong exports, we need industries that uh, employ people, generate incomes, uh, 
uh, and uh, we, we need them to be bigger than the uh, uh, current coal and gas industries are. Well, coal and gas are shrinking. The good news is that uh, using a rich endowment of um, renewable energy plus our endowment uh, in um, opportunities uh, to uh, uh, grow biomass and use that for industrial purposes, the opportunities in these areas happen to be much bigger uh, than, uh, uh, than the uh, current uh, coal and gas industries. We'll have to be clever about it. Uh, and we're not always clever, we're capable of being clever, but uh, we, we can do some pretty dumb things. And uh, if we're really dumb, we'll stop all this happening with the continued policy incoherence. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I, th I think we'll probably get on top of that. Um, and the best sign that we are getting on top of it is uh, uh, the uh, legislation in New South Wales uh, a week ago, which uh, uh, is the sort of support we need for Australia to uh, emerge as uh, a major locus of new industry based on zero emissions. And it's interesting, I was thinking about your example of uh, when you wrote the Ghana report of all the states and territories joining together with the Commonwealth government and the opposition um, to work on climate change. And we are almost there, aren't we? I mean, we have all our states and territories with net zero emissions targets and many across uh, different uh, agriculture, business, community, all calling for net zero by 2050 targets. Um, but once we've got a target, we'll need something else to make it happen, won't we? Um, one of our uh, questions that got sent in was, what sort of a national policy mechanism might we need to actually get to net zero? Um, and may, uh, what, what do you recommend? <laughs> well, one, there, there's, there are things that are best and there are things that are possible. Uh, I, it might seem immodest and, and, and might, might even tag me as a, uh, an old fuddy daddy to say it, but I think we, I got it right in the climate change review uh, public, uh, presented to the premiers and the prime minister back in, two, in 2008, September 2008, uh, uh, a carbon price as broadly based as possible, uh, uh, plus um, uh, uh, big support for zero emissions innovation. And uh, as a result of that report, we, we got the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and uh, Climate Change Authority, although that's uh, seen better days, but it can come again. Um, uh, and uh, the role of the clean energy regulator in administering uh, carbon pricing, the renewable energy target. Um, so best uh, would be that, but the good news is you don't have to do the best. Uh, um, uh, we won't have carbon pricing soon. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, w w when there's a realistic chance of having it, uh, I'll, I'll be pushing it as hard as I can. But, uh, but that's not the situation we're in now. Uh, the, the main support has to come through uh, really what uh, Biden is committed to doing. And that is big fiscal support for innovation in the new technologies. Um, 1.7 trillion US dollars goes a long way uh, uh, over four years. Well, on a population basis, uh, that's where a 25th of that, that might be uh, a couple of hundred billion. That goes a long way. Uh, and um, uh, that uh, you only need a fraction of that to uh, uh, provide the sort of support that ARENA gave in getting uh, renewable energy off the ground to give that to the first um, uh, hydrogen-based, uh, uh, renewable hydrogen-based uh, iron plants um, uh, to, to uh, uh, have an expanding uh, aluminium industry based on renewable energy. Uh, some innovations there that uh, uh, can, can greatly reduce the cost through uh, using energy in a flexible way. Give, uh, give grants uh, for, for that innovation. Very good economic rationale for that. And I explained all that in the report a dozen years ago. Uh, you don't get enough innovation if you rely entirely on market processes because a lot of the benefits of the first from the first investments go to 
people who haven't made the investment. Everyone sees what works and what doesn't. And the, the, the first people who make the investment um, spend a lot of money learning and teaching everyone else what doesn't work as well as what works. And so that justifies public investment in innovation. We had that for renewable energy that helped us to get down the cost of um, uh, solar and wind and later uh, uh, batteries. And I'm just doing it now for uh, uh, pumped hydro. We, we should be doing that as well for uh, zero emissions industry. Uh, that's what uh, China's doing. That's what Korea's doing. That's what Japan's doing. That's what the European Union's doing. That's what Britain's doing. That's what America's doing. That's what Canada's doing. Uh, uh, we're not doing it, or we're not doing it at scale. We're doing it on a small scale. Uh, let me say at once that the sort of things that um, Angus Taylor was talking about in the roadmap are, are, are good things. Uh, and uh, I, I'm a supporter of the expansion of the mandate of ARENA and the CEFC. And I, I say that as someone who had, had a role in the early mandates, but, uh, 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 but the funding is tiny compared with what other countries are doing. Now, we're cleverer people than all those Northern Hemisphere uh, people, and uh, uh, and uh, we've got better resources, uh, but a huge amount of public money uh, in those other countries might outweigh our cleverness and our superior resources, and that would be a pity. You mentioned um, Angus Taylor's technology roadmap, and I think hydrogen is one of those uh, technologies that's a priority. Um, but of course, at the moment, not, something like 99% of hydrogen is made from fossil fuels and it, it does create around 1% of global emissions. Are there any risks associated with um, pursuing hydrogen? How do we get it right? Uh, well, the, the work we're doing at Buckholden is showing that uh, with, with in the right circumstances and with very low cost of renewable energy, uh, you can get uh, surprisingly low costs of hydrogen from renewable energy. Uh, um, uh, but no doubt what you're uh, uh, wanting me to talk about is uh, coal and gas-based uh, hydrogen. Uh, through, uh, now, uh, current process of making hydrogen um, uh, are highly emissions intensive. Uh, now, if, uh, if you do have efficient processes for capturing the carbon dioxide and storing it, uh, then um, uh, there's, from a climate point of view, there's nothing wrong in principle where, with doing that. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you never know uh, uh, what technologies are going to improve most in cost. And so, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not against uh, putting resources into um, finding out how far we can get costs, but, but you do have to capture and store uh, the uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, and, if you, and it costs a lot of money to capture and store the carbon dioxide. I myself will be surprised if uh, once the hydrogen industry becomes a big industry, and it will be a very big industry in Australia, uh, as I've said, mostly probably uh, processing minerals and are being part of industrial processes rather than being exported as hydrogen, but it's going to be a big deal. I would be most surprised if uh, uh, um, the use of coal and uh, gas together with carbon capture and storage can compete with renewables based uh, hydrogen where you don't have all those costs of capture and storage. Well, that's good to hear. Um... Hopefully, if it's cheaper, it will mean that that technology is successful. Um, your new book is about uh, resetting after the recession. Of course, some, um, you know, the federal government and some state governments have started making some announcements about how they intend to help reboot Australia's economy. Um, we've got a gas-led recovery on one end, and then, as you mentioned, some of the announcements by states like New South Wales and in Victoria. How do you think we're going generally on that benchmark of what we need to do to, um, you know, really reset after this recession? I think we're still muddling through, um, and 
Uh, I'm not too critical of that. It, it was a big shock that hit us uh, early early this year. And the government's first response, just trying to get money out and keep people going with JobKeeper and JobSeeker, uh, that was a good response. Um, uh, the, the question is, what, what replaces that? What comes next? How do you uh, put in place sustainable jobs? And we're just at the early stages of thinking that through. I, I've already said that I think that uh, what uh, New South Wales has done is terrific. Uh, it will have a very big impact. Uh, generally, the other states are uh, moving in a, a good direction, uh, but haven't put the resources behind it that uh, New South Wales is committing and hasn't done, done, the others don't yet have the comprehensive policy framework that New South Wales has. If we all did as much as New South Wales, and it doesn't require a change of policy in the other states, it, uh, it's, you know, it's just, just moving further in the direction that they're going, uh, then, then an awful lot would happen. Now, it would be better still if uh, the Commonwealth got right behind that, you know, to, to have uh, um, uh, an arena committing not a couple of billion over 10 years, but a couple of billion a year to uh, uh, innovation in zero emissions industry would make a huge difference. And, and to have that alongside what the states are doing would make a big difference. And uh, uh, the very sensible arrangements uh, in New South Wales uh, proposed for underwriting uh, 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 power zero emissions power contracts. Um, uh, if, if, if it was joined by the Commonwealth and the uh, the Commonwealth Agency, the ACCC, actually made a recommendation along those lines a few years ago. Uh, the, the Commonwealth putting its resources behind would, would give it a lot more horsepower. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, at, at this stage, uh, we're um, uh, still working out uh, whether we whether we want to want to restore Australia or. Uh, uh, or the or omit to restore Australia. I start with the last chapter with uh, uh, with Brutus's uh, reflections on the tides of the affairs of men, which taken at their height, and the alternative of omission. Well, we face that sort of choice now. We haven't made it yet, uh, but uh, there's a there's a good foundation for making it um, uh, if, if uh, our our uh, leaders are up to it. I've got one last question for you, Professor Garno, because we're going to try and make sure we finish this um, as close to 7.55 as we can. Um, really, I'm sure everyone listening and certainly myself, all of these opportunities you talk about seem to make so much sense. Um, but of course, we've uh, been through a lot in Australia in terms of the kind of political um, situation on climate change. And I guess, um, which, you know, you've seen you uh, from 2008 onwards, um, in, in the face of all of that and all of that's gone past, what, um, how do you remain hopeful that we can actually do what needs to happen in Australia and actually really embrace those opportunities you're talking about? Well, uh, uh, I don't think we, we've, we have our stupid moments, but I don't think as a polity and a community, uh, as a people, we're, we're especially stupid. And the opportunity is so large and clear to solve the climate problem when it's a huge problem for the whole world, but of all the developed countries, we are the most vulnerable. Uh, for, it's really pretty stupid for us not to, uh, uh, not, not to support other countries in doing something that will do us more benefit than it will do them. Uh, and then uh, at the same time, uh, uh, take advantage of uh, rich natural resources that will uh, give us um, sources of prosperity that can replace and extend, can be far larger than uh, uh, sources of incomes growth in the, in the past that we're going to lose. Uh, whatever we do about uh, climate, um, we're, we're not going to have growing jobs in coal uh, and uh, uh, 
maybe with a little bit of a time lag, we're, we're going to see a decline in gas as well. So uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the realities are so clear uh, that uh, only a stupid polity would, uh, would deny them. And we've shown on our management of COVID that we're not that stupid. Yes, I think that has been um, something we can all be a little bit proud of in Australia and, and give us a bit of hope for the future. Um, well, our hour together is rapidly coming to an end and we didn't get through all of the questions that everybody sent in. Um, but um, for the ones we did get through, I think, um, it's so great to hear that hopeful message based in evidence and fact and um, yeah, let's, let's hope that we can embrace this future as Australia. Um, on behalf of us all here tonight, I, can I extend our gratitude to you, um, Professor Garno, for your time this evening to answer our questions. It's been so insightful. And I know from my perspective, um, it's given me some of that hope for the potential we have to become a world leader in climate action. Um, for those of you who've joined tonight, if you're interested in reading up on some of Ross's ideas, his most recent book, Superpower, um, there was some information in the chat tonight about how you can um, get yourself a discounted copy of that book. And of course, uh, we'll all be looking out for your new book in February next year. Um, I think it will be really welcome. So in closing, thank you again, Ross. Um, we don't, it's only a virtual audience, um, but I'm sure there'd be big cheer right now uh, if we were in person. Um, and I'd also like to thank the other groups that have helped organise tonight's event. ACF Community Group, McNamara, Port Phillip Climate Action Network and Glen Ira Climate Action Network. Um, and ACF's incredible donors who make events like tonight's possible. Um, if you've enjoyed tonight's discussion, you can sign up to one of ACF's community groups or find other ways to get involved on the ACF website. Um, and our chat buddies, I believe, are now putting some of those links and information um, into the chat. Um, so you can follow up there if you like. Um, so it's sad to end it, but that's all we have time for tonight. Thanks again, Ross, and thanks to all of the people who tuned in from around Australia. Um, and I hope you all have a good night. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. <laughs> See you later. Bye. See you.